is uh, we'll call the meeting to order. It's Monday, July 12th of 2021. This is the City of Stoughton Planning Commission meeting. As I mentioned, we do have a quorum. Uh, the first item of business would be approval of the minutes from the last meeting, and that was June 14th. And I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I move they be approved. And was there a second? I can second. All right. There's a motion and a second. Any questions on the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of the minutes say aye. 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 And any opposed to the minutes? That motion does carry. Next item would be the council representative report. Uh, all the person Carabello, are you logged in? I am, uh, as long as you can hear me. And the it looks like at the June 22nd council meeting, uh, R91 of 2021 was approved. And the only other things at that meeting were first reading. So that's all I have to report. All right. Uh, we'll follow that up with staff reports. Anything to report out, uh, Rodney? Well, contained in their packet is the monthly report that we put together with some recent activity. You know, recognize the, the agenda for tonight is quite full, so there's a fair number of activities going on within our department and within the city right now. If you've got any questions on the items listed, we'd certainly try to answer them for you. All right, any questions from comm commissioners on the uh, staff report? Hearing none, we'll go to the next item. And that's a request by Prisca Norton for approval of a conditional use permit for a restaurant use at 2300 US Highway 51. We do have a need for a public hearing, but before we go into that, uh, Director Shield, if you want to just kind of give us a little bit of background on this one. Yeah, this use is not inconsistent with what's, what the facilities had housed in it before. This facility is the, the wellness center on the curve of 51. You'll recognize there's been a, a restaurant or coffee shop type activity that historically had taken place in this facility, but it had been discontinued for more than 12 months. So the conditional use permitting process requires uh, that us to go through that process once again to reestablish um, a restaurant type use for that location. So that's what's before us tonight. The, the uh, public hearing will be held for the COP, but it's certainly for the location that was previously used in such a manner. All right. Are there any questions before we go into the public hearing? All right, here and on. Uh, looks like Mr. Klein, if you could mute your microphone, that would be great. All right, thank you. Am I now? I think. All right, looks like the microphone's muted. Great, thank you. Um, all right, we'll close our regular meeting and we'll open it up for the public hearing. And I didn't see anyone signed up to speak at the public hearing. Um, if there's anybody here that would like to speak to this, certainly you could. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing and then we'll reopen it, the regular meeting. And we're going to be looking for a recommendation to the city council. And as uh, Rodney mentioned, they're basically reopening a, uh, a coffee type shop in the place where we've had a couple in the past. So that the use of the building hasn't really changed uh, dramatically. I think they'll have some other uh, food to go with it. But are there any questions from commissioners? Were there any other uses of the this the space uh, different than what's proposed now? I suppose that would have had to have been a different conditional use permit, correct? Uh, that, that's correct. There, if there was other uses that were conditional in that building, those would have had to go through a separate um, process. 
Uh, this is localized to the one area of the building for the restaurant. But it would be consistent with the space that it has been uh, coffee slash food use uh, as the last previous business in it, right? That's correct. Very good. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, if you'd like, I could entertain a motion for a recommendation to the city council. I make a motion to uh, recommend the approval to the city council for this uh, space at uh, 2300 US Highway 51. All right. Thank you. Uh, Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Alder Christian Caravello. Uh, one final time for questions or comments. Hearing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 And, any, <laughs> and any opposed? None opposed. That motion does carry. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. All right, item six and seven are both coming from uh, Maggie Ganser. The first one is approval of a conditional use permit to construct a second principal building for a daycare at 1640 East Main Street. And before we go into the public hearing, um, is there any background information we should know about, Director Shield? Yeah, the zoning code requires a conditional use process where there's uh, multiple build principal buildings on a site in this zoning class. And that's the reason for the conditional use application here. I think the commissioners will, re will recall when Weevil World purchases site and develop their first building, uh, they communicated their desire and interest to have a second building on the site at that time as well. Um, so this is really just a continuation of what they had in indicated would be the case going forward. Um, and we can get into the site plan details, but um, on the screen right now is just an overview that highlights uh, the existing building is on the west side of the parcel. The new building would be along the east front frontage of Highway N. And so we can go through site plan items later, but this CUP is really limited to the, the need for a second building on the site. All right, any initial questions or comments from commissioners before we go into the public hearing? Well, uh, of the two items, I see there's six and seven that seem to address this proposal. Which one addresses the 20 new parking spaces on the, the bottom right for simplification on the site plan? Yeah, that would be a site plan item. So item seven would be where we'd talk about the specific layouts on the site. Okay. Item six is related to just the, the fact that a, a second building would be placed on the site. Okay, gotcha. I just had one question in regards to the new parking space. So I'll wait till we get to seven then. All right. Any other questions on item number six? All right, hearing none. We'll close the regular meeting and reopen for the public hearing. Nobody was signed up to speak at this one. Is there anyone that would wish to speak? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing and then we'll reopen. And then we would be looking for a recommendation from the council. Any questions? Otherwise, there is a resolution in the packet. I would entertain a motion for that. I will move to approve this. All right, is there a second? I'll second that. And any discussion? There are none, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? All right, that motion for the conditional use permit is passed. That'll go to city council in a couple weeks. Uh, item seven was related, and that one is the site plan. Uh, do you want to walk us through this one, Director Shield? Mm 
I'm not hearing you, Rodney. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, the, the building is the new building is positioned along the east frontage. It shows the site plan includes an outdoor play area, which would be fenced in, and then the, the new parking spaces that would be located on the south frontage of this property. Um, this is just a quick overview of the site plan, but there is the, the owner and representatives for the owner are here if there's more specific questions um, related to the site that we may ask them to participate as well. All right, and I think Commissioner Farrell had the first question. Okay, uh, yeah, I just, uh, looking at the 20 new parking spaces at that uh, bottom right hand side, if you will, uh, I, don't see, I don't see the north there or anywhere, but anyway, um, do those parking spaces, are they outside of the, uh, the vision triangle or site triangle of that intersection, does anybody know? Yes, yes, they are. They they meet the set. They're far enough back to meet our vision triangle clearance limitations. Okay, very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Um, as part of the staff review, I think you'll you'll recognize we highlighted, um, you know, previous discussion on this site was how to deal with whether improvements needed to be placed along County Trunk Highway N. Uh, staff feel, still feels that it is is not appropriate to extend sidewalks north on County Highway N on the west side of, uh, you know, for this property, um, recognizing there's just a cemetery to the north and there is not a safe crossing for pedestrians at, um, at the street going to the east. So we really feel that it's appropriate to not urbanize and put in sidewalks along County Highway N this graphic also illustrates one of the type constraints for right of way that would exist if that's there, if there were any additional improvements placed there. So um, the staff recommendation and resolution recognize that. I, I have a question, Mayor. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Barman. Thank you. It, it actually draw, uh, builds off of what Rodney was just discussing. There seems to be some differences in where the walkways are identified in the different drawings and plans. Uh, the one that's on the screen, it's showing a walkway on the far east of the property. It only goes to the front of the building, um, but that's different than the walkway that's shown on the landscape plan, which actually shows no walkway on the east end of the parking lot, um, but focuses on a walkway um, in the middle of the south side of the lot that goes up um, to the western side of that new building. Um, you can see it in the drawing there. So I just want clarification that we're focusing on the walkway um, that's shown here um, versus another walkway that's closer to N. Um, and, and I was kind of curious if that walkway is just in the same place where the current walkway is located. So Maggie or your team, would you like to respond to that or would you like us to respond to that? Rodney, you feel feel free to respond to that, but I do believe the drawing that we had on the one he's committing to is the one we're going to do on the front there, and I don't think that has anything to do with the existing sidewalk there, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think the existing sidewalk was positioned slightly farther to the west, and that was planned to be removed. Um, so uh, the parking I'm lot. understanding the erosion control plan to show the details and the right. grades for the new sidewalk, and I believe that's to be the correct location of the newly placed sidewalk somewhat in the middle of the site going out to main street um, i'll go to another screen so you can see the the alternate location or the existing location that'll go away just one second yep so similar to what's on this screen there will not be another an additional walkway from main uh closer to n up to the east side of the building as proposed, there is not. So I think the okay. screen that's on the, the picture that's on the screen now, I think accurately reflects both the existing location of the sidewalk, kind of on the um, east or western third of the site. And it looks like the new sidewalk is proposed, if you will, almost centered within the site out to the main street sidewalk. Thank you. I, I, I like that central location better than closer to end. So that, that works for me. 
So the existing sidewalk, that's the blacktop one. Is that what that one is? Yeah, and that, that one's set to be removed. Right, and replaced with a concrete one. And the concrete one will be positioned more in the center of the site as shown here, correct? Yeah, I think the blacktop one was always kind of meant to be temporary anyway, if I remember right. Yeah, there's a stormwater management facility that will utilize this southwestern corner of the site. Correct. Okay. Sorry. I have I have one additional question, Mayor, on the vegetation plan. All right. Go ahead. Yep. So I, I like the placement of trees along the south and southeast corner of the parking lot. I think that'll do a good job of not only providing some shade to the to the parking lot, but also help a little bit with screening. Um, but I would I would uh, not require, but I would request that there might be a little bit of understory. Uh, at least along the south end of the that parking lot to maybe potentially screen some of the vehicles and the parking lot from uh, the Main Street Drive. Because the trees themselves, I think, are going to be more mid to upper story, um, which won't screen the vehicles um, at all from traffic going back and forth on Main Street. So just a little bit of understory, maybe some some shrubs or lower landscaping plants might help to um, soften up a little bit that parking lot. All right, thank you. Hopefully the developers are making note of that. We got note of that. Excellent, thank you. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments? In regards to that I'm, landscaping plan, there, there's, uh, if those are bushes or, because I'd asked about the parking itself, the actual uh, asphalt is the, are the trees going to be in the vision triangle? They're like they're pretty close to that intersection. So the trees also are not within the vision triangle, actually. Um, we're in good shape on this corner. Okay, gotcha. Yep. I have a question. All right, Alder Person Caravello. Um, re regarding sidewalks or access to this location by pedestrians or people on bicycles or non motor vehicles, um, in regards to the intersection of Ann and 51, uh, I know that there's been a lot of discussion recently with DOT. I'm hoping that maybe somebody could. Uh, refresh us or, or give us a timeline as to when I, I believe that was included as part of the stretch from spring road into town when there might be improvements for pedestrian use of this to get folks from the east side of that intersection over to the west side of that intersection um i think you, there actually is already access there's already a pedestrian crossing um, here, here's that intersection currently as in, from an aerial view. There actually is a crosswalk and there's already sidewalks leading north along the east side of County N. Um, but to answer your question about the timeline for the DOT project in this area, it's my understanding that's about a 2025 project. And I think that will help extend sidewalk going farther east from County Highway N on the north side as well. Okay. I'm just having because you know that's oh. can be a busy intersection and a little bit. Uh, 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 some folks have mentioned that they're, I guess maybe the word is apprehensive, um, as opposed to scared or very concerned about using this intersection as pedestrians. Because some folks have mentioned to me that they don't think it's the safest intersection that, as it is currently. Well, I think yeah, you're we, correct in there. There is not pre pedestrian signals, if you will. I don't think there's pedestrian crossings. The, the crosswalks are there, but I don't think there's pre pedestrian time signals or push buttons out here. And if not, those will likely be added as part of the DOT project in 2025. Yeah, if you get specifics on a particular direction, 
um, that would be helpful as we, we talk to the DOT to let them know what the concerns are specifically. There were, there people have, uh, some folks have mentioned to me the coming from the northeast corner, which is the, the currently vacant corner, um, which uh, would be where, you know, Quick Trip has discussed putting a, a facility. Um, for going from the northeast corner, as a pedestrian to the southeast corner and also from the northeast corner to the northwest corner, which is what we're talking about where the Weeble proposed Weeble World expansion would be. So just general, I, I think the biggest concern is that there is no, there, there are painted lines um, and there are stop bars for vehicles there, but there, as Rodney mentioned, there is no pedestrian signal currently, which, is is concerning for some folks or or i'm not there yeah i guess there isn't one i'm trying to I've, I've only gone through this intersection sort of as a test as a pedestrian one time and it did seem rural all right well uh we'll provide that feedback to the dot anything else on the the site plan itself Okay, I'm I'm here none. So uh, we are looking for for approval of the site plan, and I believe that the plan commission has sole authority on this one. Is that correct, Rodney? That's correct, Mayor. Yeah. So this is this is kind of your decision. It doesn't go to city council. So at this point, um, unless you guys have anything else, I would entertain a motion to approve it. Make that motion. All right. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Second by all the person Schumacher. Okay, last call for questions or comments on the site plan. I was just going to let you remind the group that it's conditioned upon the COP of being approved by by council. Good clarification. All right. Um, here, no questions or comments. All in favor, say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed. That's approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep, we're hoping the cost of materials go down for you. Thank you. Have a good night. Um, item number eight is a request by Rob Real Estate Brokerage and Builders LLC to approval for a preliminary plat on the West End of Isham Street extended. And this one here, I think we've looked at a little bit already um, in the past, but we're here tonight for the preliminary plat, which does require a public hearing. Are there any questions or comments before we open it up for the public hearing? I had one question and uh, excuse my ignorance, but I, I, I went out there on a the bike and, and there's not a whole lot of really good quality trees, but there are some in there and I was wondering does the city have any sort of policy on tree replacement when a developer comes in and clear cuts? Is there a you know, cut down 12 inch tree, you got to plant four, three inch trees or something similar? So there's nothing specific about a tree for a tree type uh, scenario, but there certainly are, are street terrace tree requirements when new plats are put in. So when the roadway is put in here, there would be a requirement for street trees to be put back in in the terrace. Okay, but that's only like two in front of each lot, correct? It's certainly dependent on that. That's correct. Okay, because I, I don't, well, perhaps, I don't know. I don't know if we get one for one, but that, that may be something more for the new sustainability committee also. But uh, uh, I know when I worked for the Navy, we had on the bases, we had a policy, very mathematical uh, approach to preserving the number of quantity and quality of trees that were there. Yeah, and, and we do have a, a replacement policy, and I don't remember all the specifics, but it seems to me that I think isn't there money put into escrow or something, and usually they work with the, the city forester on, on the types of trees. Is that partly right? Yeah, but it's not, it's, it's, there's a dedicated public right of way here already. Um, and, and what would have to be done is when the street improvements are put back in, there's a street tree planting requirement. 
and if there's trees to be um, in addition to that, that might be a park park improvement that would be necessary. Okay. All right. Any other questions before we go into public hearing? I have just just one. I've had some neighborhood residents in the area there, Mayor, who have asked about um, sidewalks. I know I know it's just kind of tangential to the the plat issue that we're looking at tonight, but they're wondering if and when this street comes in, um, if there would be a sidewalk just on the south side of the new street, or if there would also be a sidewalk on the north side. And I, I, I didn't think there'd be a sidewalk on the north side because it's going to mostly remain in uh, uh, protected land that the city owns, correct? I, I think there still would be a sidewalk required as part of the street extension on both sides. On both sides? I believe that would be the case. I mean, that would be part of our review of our, our construction plans, but that certainly would be anticipated. All of your public streets are improved in new subdivisions with sidewalks on both sides. Thank you. Uh, just one more question, and again, ignorant of a lot of the processes here, but uh, has the owner at 301 uh, Isham, uh, have they already been notified of this? All property owners were directly mailed invitations to tonight's meeting related to the public hearing. So anybody within 300 feet definitely got a mailing. It was published you know, to the community at large as well, but we've actually spoke to probably both of those adjacent property owners that have been mentioned tonight. Okay, gotcha. Sure. All right, anybody else before we go into the public hearing? Hearing none, we'll close the regular meeting and open the public hearing. And I didn't see anybody signed up for this one, but certainly if there's somebody here that wishes to speak, uh, let us know now. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing and reopen for our regular business. Are there any questions at this point from commissioners? Hearing none, we'd be looking for a recommendation to the city council. So contained in your packet is a resolution that's been prepared related to the preliminary plat. Um, I think I wasn't at the previous meeting, but there was some discussion about recognizing a future trail extension along the west end of the site. Um, and that's shown on the, the draft plat as previously um, illustrated on the screen. And I think that would encompass at least a 25 foot width that's anticipated to be a parkland dedication area. Um, and I'll pull that up back up on the screen so you can see that. Um, so on the far west end, you'll see there's a 25 foot area that's shown on this in outlot one. So outlot one is really planned to be dedicated to the city as a whole overall anyhow for stormwater management but it's trying to recognize the western 25 feet is anticipated to be utilized for a potential trail connection to the south. The is kind of the standard for trail width is 50 feet. So it was anticipated that at such time the develop, uh, development occurs farther to the west that they would then be obligated or um, be required to put together the additional 25 feet to create that 50 foot wide corridor if still necessary. Rodney, what are the two six foot gaps between lots three and four? So they're actually not gaps, um, but they're, it's good to point out they're actually utility easements. So there's okay. a, a utility easement on either side of the property line between three and four. Um, generally, that's probably to recognize um, you, you know different utilities, whether it's electric. I think it's for electric in this case. Okay, so that was just the, it's the six foot shared between two lots, so a 12 foot right away in there? Yeah, 12 foot, 12 foot total, six feet on either side of the property line, correct. Got it, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, uh, as Rodney mentioned, there's a resolution uh, in the packet, I'd entertain a motion for approval. I'll make that motion. Oh, go ahead, Tom. I said I'll, I'll make that motion to approve it. And I'll second Tom's motion. 
All right. Last chance for questions or comments on this one. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed, that motion carries. Thank you. And item number nine is a request from Kettle Park West LLC for approval of a preliminary plat named replat of the meadows. And this one will also require a public hearing. And Director Shield, you want to give us some background why we're replatting this one? Can't hear him. Nope, can't hear you, Rodney. I, I had such a good story I was telling. Um, so just to let you know that the eyebrow section of this street off of Telemark was was platted originally. Um, they're looking at reconfiguring the lots where that does not need to be uh, in place any longer. Uh, you, you'll note that they've been able to accomplish additional lots to be in here without as much public infrastructure. So at a staff level, we're very supportive of getting rid of this eyebrow right of way area, um, but that's the primary measure being completed here by getting rid of that dedicated half circle. And then there's some lot line adjustments both on this block and then on the other side of Telemark, there's some small lot line adjustments there as well. Okay, thank you. Any initial questions before we go into the public hearing? Hearing none, we'll close the regular meeting and open up the public hearing. Um, nobody has signed up to speak on this one. If there's anyone that wishes to speak, please let me know now. Here are none. We'll close the public hearing and we'll reopen the discussion on this preliminary plat um, approval. Any questions or comments? Mayor, I should just highlight, I, I indicated some lot line adjustments. Actually, there's lot line adjustments in more than just on those locations. You'll note on the north side of Jackson Street here, you'll see the the lot lines have ad been adjusted slightly here as well. So um, the lot configurations have slightly been modified as well as that right of way area being modified. But the right of way is probably the most significant change that that's really causing this need. Yeah, and we've been told that the reason they're changing the the layout on the plat here is to accommodate a certain size um, home that the builder that they've been negotiating with is looking at building out here in these lots. Any questions or comments from commissioners? I was looking at their report of it and in their, their original subdivision, they have uh, 37 traditional single family lots and then in the proposed they've got 44 where where are these uh, additional seven lots that are being added to this so they're actually in, in you'll see some of them in this block here block four if you will this larger block here um, and then you'll see the lot line adjustments occurring on block 11 on the north side of Jackson Street the reconfiguration here is added lots as well. And then I, I believe also in block um, six, this block on the lower center part of the page, also lot line adjustments have, have increased the lot total in this block. And then I think All there's right. also one more lot in this last block along the park land dedication um, block three. All right. I certainly do appreciate that they're going to knock out that that eyebrow thingamajig. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none. So we're looking for a recommendation to the city council on this one. And Rodney has a resolution up there. Um, I would entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to recommend to council. All right, is there a second? I'll second. 
Second by Commissioner Barman. Uh, last chance for discussion on this one. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed. That motion carries. That'll be on City Council in a couple of weeks. Um, item number 10 is a request by Bob Dvorak for approval of the final plat for the 51 West development. And who would like to start this one off? Looks like Director Shield has it up there. Uh, what are we looking at doing on both sides? Yeah, this, this would be a final plat for that encompasses both sides of 51. Uh, the page that's on your screen is the western side of 51. Um, you'll note that there is uh, the lot configuration that's very consistent with the concepts that you've seen in previous iterations. Um, and then on the west side of, or the east side of 51 is the other half of the development area. Once again, uh, consistent with the conceptual plans that have been viewed uh, throughout the project. Um, there is there is just one staff level item that I think we should raise and talk about and maybe try to work towards uh, um, solidifying as part of the final plat that's not in, as part of the resolution. And it talks a little bit about the access um, that might be necessary or, or should be restricted possibly. And, and I'll just highlight where I'm thinking we'd like to discuss this more, but look at it in final uh, form um, for the, for the, uh, before the council. So along the, the North Platte line here, Rutland on Town Line Road, I really don't see a, an interest in having a direct connection to Rutland on Town Line Road from Lot 1 or out Lot 1 nor from lot 17, I think we would probably want to consider having access restrictions on those as noted there. And then uh, where it's a little uh, undecided here, but I think this first leg or a certain distance back from uh, Rutland on Townline Road on both lot two and lot 17, not, not the full length, but uh, a reasonable distance back, we probably will want to contemplate having a restriction for access uh, there as well. Um, Sorry, I don't have that ironed out and will have before the council. So I'd look, like to look at having just a little latitude and trying to refine that before council that takes action on it. Uh, looking still for the plan commission's support to move forward with the resolution as presented um, and recognize staff may present a slightly modified uh, language related to access um, limitations in, in, those, in those areas. Um, Likewise, there's just another area on the east side that I think might be worth uh, considering having access control restrictions um, along the north side of lot 18 um, off of the future Rutland on Town Lane Road or whatever road this would be, <laughs> as well as the area of Velkman Way on the north side of Velkman Way between on, on lot 18. So Sorry, I haven't fleshed those out completely, but I, I'd like some latitude to be able to try to present uh, some some variation of that to the council as part of their action on the final plat. So Rodney, by that you mean to um, restrict like a driveway access that would be within, let's say into this lot 17 or, or the page you're looking at uh like lot 18 like it would have to be uh 50 feet back from highway 51 is that what you're asking about yeah the, on, on many plats and actually the dot has yet to chime in on this yet but they'll probably have no access from lot 18 onto 51 for example or uh, off of lot 17 on the 51. so i'd anticipate those type of dot regulations along the 51 corridor uh, but where we've got local control on to Rutland on Townline Road or Velkman Way or or the other uh, North South Street on, on Oak Opening Drive, yes, you've described what I would like to see, the potential uh, limitations on where driveways could be positioned or not, not put in place at all. All right, I'm assuming like on the, on the south end of the lot 18 that you've got, it's what, 235.7 feet or something like that. And 
you'd restrict it to like like I said, maybe it's got to be fifty feet off of that opening or or uh, from the access to fifty one, correct? Yeah, and, and recall ultimately we really envision Valkman Way not the connection to fifty one going away long term. So, yeah. so it might not even be a moot. It might be almost a moot point in the Valkman Way area. Um, but just being cognizant of if something doesn't happen, to try to prevent traffic snarls from causing a hazard if it's too close to a, a corner there. Sure. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that that's what what you intended for your for the latitude you're asking about. Yep. And I'd I'd have it cleaned up and presentable to the developer and and council for their action. So. So Rodney, just in terms of us making a motion to to conditionally approve this preliminary plat, yep. we, we don't need to get specific about distances in our wording. We just say that with the idea that um, access would be looked at for lot 18, lot 17, and lot two. I mean, you want something more along those lines? Yeah, I think you're right on on track. What, what I really was anticipating is you'd you take action on the the resolution that's contained in the packet and mm -hmm. then in addition to that indicate that staff plans to present um, specific language about access limitations to the council on, on okay. various spots along Rutland Duntown Line Road, Oak Opening and Buckman Way. Thank you. All right, anybody else have any thoughts or questions about that issue or anything else? I, I have a quick thought question um, regarding Oak opening at Rutland Dunn Townline Road. Does does your thinking also, um, you know, and, and looking at widths and not what that accommodates right now, um, does your thinking also go to potentially making sure that Oak opening, for example, would be of such a width that could accommodate left turn only lanes since there would be considerable amount of traffic coming out of lot 17 since it wouldn't be able to access 51 any other way i don't know if the width that's represented here what that accommodates or is so that it's a, thinking too far ahead so it's a 66 foot wide right away in this location and that's how it's been uh, you know, move through the entire approval process. Um, there is potential to accommodate a left turn lane um, and a right turn straight, as well as a, an in lane within that. So if you think of each lane as being 12 feet wide or so, you can accommodate a number of lanes, three lanes if you need to um, at, a, at a corner like that, a turn lane and one going either, either direction. Thanks. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions or comments? I was just going to highlight that the, the, the owner and developer are here if there's questions or input that they'd like to share as well. I, I think the commissioners would be open to that. The only thing I'd like to say, Rodney, is um, you and I have had discussions about these access points, and I have I have passed that on to uh, in conversations with our team and uh, potential uh, interested buyers at this time. So everybody's well aware of the access and, and the concern there. And, and Bob, can you can you highlight uh, whether you've gotten word back from the DOT on their review of the of the plat yet? I haven't seen anything, so I'm curious to know if you have. Uh, no, we have not at this time. Last I heard, the end of last week, uh, our expectations are to hear something by mid this week uh, from the DOT. Thank you, Bob. I got an updated one. This is Steve Trumlin, MSA. Um, the comments were passed along to the next group of DOT representatives. Uh, it was likely going to be two weeks from that message at the end of last week. So probably more next week response back. Okay. Okay, thanks.
All right. Anything else on this one? Otherwise, we're we're looking for a recommendation to the council with some of that language that Commissioner Barman had. Yeah, really, um, staff is recommending moving forward with the resolution, recommending a, you know, that to Common Council with an additional aspect of it about the access control on those various locations to be presented to Council. So moved. All right, is there a second? I'll second that. All right. I, I should just further clarify one one point. In your packet, you actually had a version of the resolution that had a few blanks. On your screen, those blanks have been filled in. There was dates and resolution numbers that have been added, and that's the version that we're acting on and sending to council. Uh, for example, the data when the, the plat would expire and the resolution when the preliminary plat was was acted on. So just for clarification, that's what we're acting on. Uh, works right. for me. I, I still so move. Okay. All right. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Uh, next items, are the next two together? Next one is Scott Truel's building addition at 540. All right, and that one was uh, earlier tonight at Business Park North meeting. I think you took action on that one. So we do have a request for a site plan approval for 540 Business Park Circle. So for a quick summary, um, commissioners will recall seeing the slightly larger version of this edition last year when you took action on this edition. It was originally planned to be uh, approximately 12,000 square foot edition. Um, and uh, Scott Trills here represent the owner, but they've scaled it back slightly to about an 8,000 square foot edition. The stormwater management areas are still being fully improved as if it was a full build out um, and the building modifications um, are consistent with last year's action. Uh, the landscaping plan was slightly modified to accommodate the, the reduced footprint of the larger of the building addition. Um, but in essence, it's it's the same project, just slightly scaled back from last year. Any questions or comments from commissioners or anyone from Business Park North? So, I mean, I had raised uh, where the utility proposed utility line is going to be moved to and um, and whether the parking and that would be adequate. Uh, and those were the only issues that were talked about during business park meeting. OK, anything from the builders? We're just here. Thank you. Uh, as you said, it's a reapproval uh, from last year. Um, if you've got any questions, happy to, to address them. All right. Any questions or comments from commissioners? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve the, the site plan approval. I'll make, I'll make motion. a motion. Take your pick. All right. <clears throat> And I think I heard a second in there somewhere as well. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed. That motion carries. Thank you. All right. Looks like the next few items are on here for discussion. So number 12 is um looks like we're really want to just kind of define the differences between the general development plan versus a specific implementation plan is that what i gather from this that's correct mayor all right who's going to do the explaining you or michael 
Well, I'll give a quick overview. Uh, thank you. Uh, but certainly Michael's can chime in as well. So the, the general development plan process um, and the specific implementation plan step are slightly different. And I think it's really something we stress upon the fact that the GDP or the general development plan known as the GDP really establishes very specific criteria that are slightly different than what the underlying zoning would be. So let's say we've got an MR24 parcel of land um, and they want to put on a building, but it can't meet those setbacks by the traditional zoning, the MR24. They have the potential to go through this general development planning process and be considered for, say, reduced setbacks. Those very split, explicit um, deviations, if you will, from the underlying zoning articulated in the request from the applicant and then carried forward through the plan commission and council action. If those are approved, then those become the standards for that particular parcel of land. Um, now there's some trade-offs to doing that and, and that's why this the next step known as the specific implementation plan or the SIP step uh, really allows for a, a, a real hard look, if you will, at the site plan in more detail. Um, and that step, the SIP step, is actually an action only, only held by the plan commission. Much like you do site plans, and we just did one tonight for Weeble World, the actual site plan action is handled by the plan commission. Whereas the general development plan is a zoning step, and that zoning step and change is, is a recommendation by plan commission to council, and council has to approve it before that can be uh, put in place. So I, we just wanted to reiterate kind of the, the slight nuances between the two, GDP and SIP. There's part of the same process, but we wanted to highlight the need for us to be quite specific when we're going through a general development planning process to make sure we understand what standards are being deviated from and what the new standards would be going forward for that particular parcel of land. Now, and I think the council is, council commissioners have done a good job of trying to vet that out and, the, and there's trade-offs when you're trying to seek some, if you will, deviations from the standards from the traditional zoning. Um, and maybe there are trade-offs in additional landscaping or, or due to site constraints, it makes sense to do it differently. But Nonetheless, uh, we wanted to highlight this. I think City Attorney Dragney helped helped um, outline this for you in this memo, um, but we're certainly available to answer questions if you'd like to discuss it more as well. Are you, are you available now, or you want absolutely. those questions off? Yeah, absolutely, that, now is fine. So, so I, I think where we've had the most confusion arise, and, and, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is when there's been specific building, conceptual building footprints that were included in the GDP. I mean, the way this is worded here uh, by Attorney Dragney, it's focusing on changes in the standards, but often those changes in standards are illustrated through a conceptual building footprint. And then when we start getting to site plans, then in some cases, the developer feels like their building footprint has already been approved versus what's really been approved is changes to the standards. Am I, am I incorrect in my yeah. kind of summary there? Yeah, I think you're correct. Oftentimes there's a lot of narrative and a lot of illustrations that try to, well, they illustrate what the vision is for that area. But what it comes down to is we, and the, the applicant along with us have to do a good job of really being certain of what the, the change criteria are going forward. And so I, I think we're, we're continuing to prove upon what we put into the actual ordinance, the rezoning ordinance. And that way, when you've got 30 pages of illustrations and, and um, character issues, it might boil down to only you know, you know, six or eight deviations from the standards and we want to articulate those well so they're they're clear both to the the applicant going forward and future you know builders on that site as well as to us as reviewers and and the commissioners going forward so so as commissioners we need to be clear that 
we're just approving those deviations to the code essentially versus approving the specific concepts that are used to illustrate those changes? That's correct. All right. And, I, and as I said, uh, Commissioner Barman, I, I really think staff's going to uh, continue to improve upon how we make sure we present that clearly and how we articulate it also in the, the rezoning ordinances associated with those so that that all of us are, are a, have a better understanding going forward. Cool. Thanks. That helps a lot. You're welcome. All right. Anybody else have any questions or everybody fully understand that? There'll be a test after the meeting. All right, we'll go to the next item. And that one is uh, discuss current development requirements for trails. So I, I don't know how deep a dive the commissioners want to go on in on this one, but I know that there's been um, interest in understanding how how trails are being accommodated in, in development plans that we see at the commission level. Um, as you know, the Parks and Rec Committee plays an active role in, in, in engaging during the development process and has done so like on Highway 51 West project, they, they've been actively involved in that. Um, so what we did include is the standards that are outlined by the Parks and Rec or operation. Um, they're here for your edification or your um, review, but certainly we, we do lean on them to provide us guidance in, in this area. And we're trying to implement those guidelines going forward. Now, not all of them are codified, if you will, um, but even if they're not codified, you know, adopted plans, we're trying to implement those. So this, these are standards that we're trying to be aware of and, and work to facilitate during the development process. Yeah, I would say that 51 West is a good example and Kettle Park West as well, where we've really tried to kind of change our philosophy and have more linear and, and ensure that we have enough buffer area around the trails. And that's something that Park and Recreation, which Phil could speak to since he's the chairperson, um, could kind of chime in on a little bit. Uh, we do have uh, park design guidelines that we're hoping to get approved here in the next several months. Um, so we've been working on those types of things. And then the other thing we're trying to do is we're trying to do a more collaborative style of staff review, not only with park and rec, but with utilities and police, fire, and EMS as well. Uh, is in public works, of course, you know, when we start talking about the eyebrows and the cul-de-sacs, um, certainly the, uh, those things come into, into the conversation as far as providing the city services in the most efficient manner. And it's the same thing with parks. We want to have a park that meets the needs of the community, but we also want them to be able to be something that we'll be able to maintain. Am I missing anything, Phil? No. Uh, I think this is really good that that this has been put in our meeting tonight just to raise awareness of, uh, you know, requirements for parks and where we'd like to go with them. One thing that, that just comes to mind as we're talking about this and as Al brought up uh, about trees and the sort when his, his Navy experience of the um, you know, taking out a 12 foot tree and doing the math and making sure that they're, or, or a, a, a 12 inch, you know, well, you're taking out a 12, a, a tree that has a 12 foot diameter and adding uh, four trees that are three feet or, you know, whatever the math would be there to make that work. Um, one of the points of this thing, um, is maintaining natural vegetation so that people are just mindful before before stuff happens and in planning processes uh natural vegetation is maintained and there's just a thought it's like you know where would a, a natural trail or where would amenities that are going to be planned in the future naturally fit and just keeping that in mind 
as these processes go forward. Any other commissioners have any thoughts on this one? Yeah, a question. Uh, the here we're talking about park trails, and does that mean both uh, hiking and biking in general? That's how I, I understand it to mean more of your your off your off roadway paths and and corridors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And it, this is probably yeah. another one, maybe for the, I see there's a sustainability or sustainment committee uh, getting put together, but I see paved pathways and I would think non-paved would be best uh, for the environment and for users too, actually as a, as a runner and a biker, uh, I prefer non-paved myself, so. Yeah, we have that, quite a little bit. We have a oh, little debate sorry. going on amongst us about whether they should be paved or unpaved. And it sounds like some of that's personal preference. There, there, there's also a question of some accessibility issues that come into whether trails should be or should not be or need to be or do not need to be paved. So there are some, uh, you know, there will be some things that are requirements. There will be some things that are debate, I, I think, uh, depending on, on on what the trail is and what it connects to and various things of that nature. So it's, yeah, I, 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 I'm kind of a leave it, uh, you know, a gravel trail fan myself, but for some things, appropriateness, that might not be the, the uh, most equitable as far as access goes. Uh, yeah, good point as far as the accessibility. I think these guidelines are definitely helpful and healthy in order to think about uh, as as developments are proposed in here and and I'm happy to see that some of these will be uh, thought about in in a little bit greater detail because uh, we certainly would like to get the the whole city connected as it expands through the trail system. Um, I think that would be all great stuff. Yeah, and the other thing that Park and Rec is trying to do is identify future parkland as the, as we might, you know, grow and, and develop um, some of the vacant land that's in our comprehensive plan. That one, I think, is going to be a little bit more complicated because you have stormwater issues to take into consideration. You have topography, and I'm sure there's others, but I know that's kind of the next place that the committee wants to get to. I know just soil types and that are, are difficult as we've got some definite wet areas that are around and uh, how, how do we uh, highlight those or how do we not d disturb those as, as few a ways as possible. Also uh, on that point um, regarding, you know, corridors and connectivity has been a very, very hot topic in, you know, considering since March of last year with more people being out and about while trying to be, there being more people being out with other people while trying to stay away from other people um, <laughs> and trying to accommodate that. Um, there's just, you know, trail use and connectivity and people saying, you know, if we're here and we want to get over here, how do we do that? Or or with you know uh, uh, continuing connection to Madison via trails and other points, this is going to be a yeah. There's a lot of interest in this. I like yeah. to think of the trail system as as being sort of like the nervous system for the for the whole city, and that it should definitely be be connected together. Yeah, one of the challenges that we have is we have some infill connectability that we'd like to do. And there was a change in state law in the last, I don't know, I'll say five years or so, 
where we can no longer acquire that land through eminent domain. So the property really, property owner really has to give us permission to purchase those, those areas to make those connections. And that's really been a challenge, not only for Stoughton, but really all uh, communities that are, that are facing some of the same challenges on their connectivity. And we're still hoping that the state legislators will someday roll back that law, but didn't happen in this budget, didn't happen in the budget two years ago. So I, I don't know where that's gonna end up. It might take a while. I think that could be something solved by branding just to, to get people to understand how, uh, I mean, what, what the real importance is behind there. Like, is it is it great just to leave this as, as a vacant piece of land or should we do something with it so that, yeah, you can get people from point A to point B and perhaps maybe begin to enjoy the vacant piece of land rather than just having it sit there fallow. Yeah, and sometimes it's literally, you know, in people's backyards. We have a couple examples down uh, behind Scotland Home and Stoughton Health, where we have the trail going there, and and some of the residents down there just don't like the thought of a of a trail connecting in their backyard between them and the river. Um, but you know, those are conversations that we continue to have, and hopefully at some point um, we can make those happen. Any other thoughts on the trails? Yeah, just as I mentioned earlier, I see a lot of crosstalk potential here with the new sustainability or sustainment committee or commission rather. Uh, so I think that needs to be encouraged. Definitely, it's a good suggestion. All right, the next one is uh, discuss drive through safety issues. And this one has come out most recently, you know, during COVID where our drive-throughs are typically established uh, with a conditional use permit. And I'll let Rodney explain the rest. Yeah, so we have some standard requirements for drive-through um, dimensions and st uh, statistics, if you will, about stacking and areas that have to be in place related to that for the permanent installations and related to conditional use applications. Um, certainly we've we've seen some heightened use of drive-through facilities in the last 18 months. And we're we're learning you know that we might have to look at how we deal with that differently. Um, we've got two sites that have probably stood out in many minds as to being problematic and one one is Culver's um, and one is Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I think the severity of the Culver's one is probably uh, less than, than it might be at the Dunkin' Donuts one. Um, the Dunkin' Donuts one seems to queue up enough where there's some stacking that ends up into the Kettle Park way and, and actually impedes some of the traffic in the, the roundabout that desires to get into the Walmart area on Kettle Park way. So, uh, you know, one of our first tools that we'll do is we'll send out letters to the, the affected property owners to see if they can look at their their business models to see if there's ways that they can improve those. Um, but nonetheless, there, there at least appears to be violations that could be identified, um, but really ultimately we have to figure out how to get them corrected. And, and as we can appreciate that the, the best way to do that is in trying to carefully evaluate drive-throughs when they come to us the first time. And now I don't think anybody could have understood the the impacts over the last year, um, but uh, it does give us give us pause. Um, is our queuing distance an appropriate length, or is there ways where they have two lanes of of drive through opportunities, or can they circle their site differently to help stack them on their own site and not create problems off site? So those are things I'm, I think we just have to be uh, cognizant of going forward. Um, and you know, I think what we can at staff level indicate is we're already communicating with the uh, the developers for the Kettle Park West area. Recall the, the lot that Dunkin' Donuts is on is, is actually planned to have, I believe, five different buildings on it. Um, and not all of them are there yet at this point. And so we've already put them on notice that 
as you come to us with your next phase for the other future buildings to be positioned on that site, uh, anticipate us really scrutinizing the traffic plan um, and how to address you know, what seems to be a challenge already with the Dunkin' Donuts access. So um, we're, we're setting the, the groundwork to try to do, do that better, uh, but we'll also send out some letters to property owners to indicate there might be a need to deal with how they, how they stack their, their traffic differently. Um, again, some of them aren't going to be easy to correct, right? I mean, if you've got uh, a limited real estate site with the drive-through that's already there, how, how can they manage that differently to move people through or differently? Um, but that's something they're going to have to reflect on as well, and we're going to have to pay uh, closer attention to it going forward on, on our reviews as well. I'm, uh, I'm curious how many of these problems um, existed prior to COVID? Um, I, I can't say with absolute certainty, but I, I think I wasn't aware of either one of those prior to COVID. Doesn't mean they weren't happening or there wasn't ever a, a situation where there was queuing that occurred that I, I wasn't aware of, um, but certainly that the, the, the drive-through facilities have really taken off. And I think that's evidenced by the, the recent environment we're in. Yeah, we've been getting feedback from, you know, from the police department regarding these. And, you know, common sense would say it's a public safety issue, but it's, it's kind of a zoning issue. I mean, I don't think that the, the public safety committee really has the authority to do anything, but certainly, you know, providing feedback to us is helpful so we can kind of understand the scope of the problem and try to take corrective action. This, this is perhaps getting a little in the weeds, but just one question. When it comes to a commercial establishment, what is the distance from an intersection to a curb cut for a, uh, well, maybe specifically for a drive through What's that distance required? So a driveway distance back, there, there isn't a distance from a drive-through, if you will. There's a queuing length that has to be accommodated of 100 feet, stackable of 100 feet. So it's essentially five cars, if you will, in, in most situations can be, have to be accommodated from the teller, not from the teller, but from the um, point of ordering back. I believe it's 100 feet from there. Now that doesn't mean that's to the curb cut or the opening of the street. You're trying to accommodate them on their own site with that 100 feet of stacking storage. Um, yeah, I was gonna say Dunkin' Donuts doesn't have 100 feet, I don't believe from the, if you consider the exit of the uh, roundabout as an intersection anyway, there's certainly, I don't think 100 feet from there to their, to their curb cut. Um, well, I, I think there probably is. I mean, you is think it? about in quantities of cars, I believe it's five cars. I think there might be uh, capacity okay. to store approximately five cars in that in that area. Is that adequate? Apparently not, <laughs> right, in this situation. Um, so it, going forward, we might have to work with them to see if they can reroute their traffic, if you will, snake them through their own site so that they are not entering at that at that point off of Kettle Park Way, but using their access point farther to the west or farther to the north on Kettle Park Way. Um, you know, some of it's driver train, training drivers to be, you think of the Culver's location, you know, if they stack into the street, most of the time they're really, or they could be essentially along the park lane, parking lane on the west side of Nygaard Street. And, and that's probably not really impeding traffic per se until it starts getting up to the, the driveway is now at Dollar General or or the intersection with Roby. So, um, you know, the severity or the public health safety issue is different maybe on the two sites, but still an issue we got to try to resolve. One location that'll probably be uh, a difficult like this in the future, um, the uh, the Taco Bell KFC, I've seen a lot of times that drive through queue running into running out onto Nygaard, which isn't an issue at the moment because that's just a dead end street. Yeah. Um, but if, if that one cuts through, then that could also be another location. And I know that that drive through line is that's pretty tight 
in there already up to like the adjacent property line even. Yeah, very true. If, if memory serves, the, the most recent two drive-throughs we've approved were the, the Starbucks development and then the last one that we approved on Jackson uh, in the uh, Walmart complex. Is that Bell Coleman Way there in Jackson? I forget the name of the street. No, it's not Bill Coleman. But anyway, Empire. how are we on stacking for those two locations? Oh, I, I think I think we're still looking good. You know, the Starbucks one, in reality, there is quite a bit of private real estate before it impacts any of the public travel ways there. So I, I don't think you're going to have any issues with that one. Um, likewise, I think the stacking queue on the one at the corner of Kettle Park Way and Jackson Street also will have significant queuing length on their own site before it would become an issue for that. Oh, um, Michael just chimed in. Pizza Hut. Um, yeah, Pizza Hut, you know, I think they've got adequate queuing space for for a, at least five, if not more, uh, vehicles on their site as well. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we won't have an issue there as well. It seems like we've got more, more private real estate on both of those projects to to accommodate stacking. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think part of the issue is the businesses where you pre-order, you don't have as much of an issue as those where you order on site. And then some of the establishments, obviously their business model is, is faster than others. And I think that's that's part of the issue. So I think, you know, for example, the Pizza Hut, most people will order ahead of time. So they're their food should be ready when they get there. So that shouldn't be an issue for them, but it might be a little different at Culver's or at Duncan when they're making the orders when you get there. But they have apps now too. So I think some people are starting to pre-order there as well. Well, we just wanted to provide this information and, and be aware of the fact that we're trying to evaluate them uh, with a with a, with a stronger understanding of of our environment these days and these are the types of issues that you know we might be asked when we're out in the public and now at least you have some information and if they want more specifics you can always you know direct them to us i think these three topics were definitely very helpful and and we should also try to think about uh, some other ones that may be potentially helpful in the future just for um, clarifications or especially if um, zoning or if, if state level information changes and how that impacts what uh, we would need to do just so that we're, we're up to date on, on how things are supposed to be working. All right. Um, the next item is uh, to discuss our future meetings. And we've done some testing. Um, so right now, obviously, we're virtual. Our desire is to get to be in person. And then what we have is, one thing we have is called a hybrid. And the hybrid meeting is basically a combination of in person and then virtual. And we have the ability to do that um, using the equipment in the city council chambers. That's where we have our in-person meetings. And the testing we've done successfully has been on the Zoom platform. Apparently that one is compatible with our equipment and the go-to meeting is not. So as we transition, our plan commission meetings will have to be on Zoom as well as our city council meetings. And they basically, they feed the, the stream right into the room through the speakers and the microphone and right into the tv station to stream it either online or on the cable channel so we've tested it it works really well the biggest thing you have to remember is if you're if you're on zoom it's the same as any other virtual meeting if you're in the room you basically just uh you don't even need a computer in the room because the host will have the computer and the host can share their screen on the TV screens that are in the room. So you'll be able to see the people that are calling in. 
So that, that's kind of how it's going to work. Um, and you do have the option of calling in on the telephone as well if you had to, or on the Zoom phone call number if you had to as well. Uh, the only disadvantage of that is you won't be able to see everybody. So at the city council meeting tomorrow night, um, we we have a, a policy change for the council. I don't know if that necessarily applies to the plan commission. Not really clear on that because the commission is kind of its own separate body. But we're trying to get, I think, some input on whether or not you guys feel you're ready to go back to the in-person or the hybrid meetings. Did I miss anything, Rodney? Yeah, we we certainly need to understand when we're moving to the next um, um, stage or how we're going to do so. We've got public hearing notices that need to go out soon going forward. So we're we're looking for input if you're wanting to um, be all in person or if you want to go to hybrid or if you want to continue to utilize this practice until council adopts their practice, you know, that might be the direction to go as well. Uh, I personally like the uh, hybrid option because when I'm on vacation or for some other reason not available to attend in person, it still gives me the option to participate in the meetings. And uh, I know when I was on vacation in June, uh, I was able to participate in that meeting, uh, which was great because although I ran out battery at the very end, because of trying to find a place with a, a Wi-Fi, but uh, uh, it just gives you the option to participate no matter where you are. Yeah, we agree and the same thing for the public. Although the public will be able to watch them on WSTO or stream anyway, but if there's somebody, say one of the developers that you know, are trying to take a day off or they're out of town, they could certainly call in and, and participate that way as well. So we think the hybrid is a good option now that we figured out um, technology wise how to deal with it. And I guess we're kind of wondering, you know, if you guys are, are ready to take the plunge and go back in person or if you want to take the wait and see. And I'm not sure when the public notices you're putting out now, Rodney, are they for August or September? Um, there's some for August, even, I believe. Yeah, I think we've got to get some out for August by the end of this week, I believe. Yes, August. I say take the plunge and go in person. I mean, I just enjoyed my first Stoughton Fair uh, swimming in an ocean of people and being fully vaccinated. I, I felt safe, but I also felt like we were back to 2019 and uh so you know given we just went through that evolution i'm sort of scratching my head as to why anything other than a in-person meeting is uh being considered i my experience in in the previous career also whenever we had public hearing meetings i i both hated them and i loved them uh because you never knew when somebody might actually poke you in the chest but but i think people in general appreciate more the opportunity to see that person in person. Um, and I think also that uh, this, I could be wrong, but I think they're more inclined to be polite. Uh, the internet gives you a bit of a, I'm in my car, uh, I can say and do things I wouldn't necessarily do when I'm standing in front of somebody. So I, I vote it full in person myself. That's my two cents. I'm all right to go full physical. I don't have any issue with with doing that. Um, I do like having the hybrid in their hybrid availability in there. Again, as as Tom had said, that it allowed them to participate in that meeting. I also feel that um, that would give a little bit greater accessibility to uh, any of the public at large in order to potentially participate in the meetings rather than to passively watch them on WSTO. All right, so I'm, I'm sensing that people at least are ready to go back. Uh, we can do the hybrid. I mean, ideally, um, as many people that feel comfortable showing up in person can do so. So 
I guess what I'm hearing is you guys are ready to do that in August. Yes. 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 All right. And as I mentioned, it'll be on Zoom. So I would suggest at least for the first one, we try to log in a little earlier than normal to make sure that everybody gets kind of used to Zoom if you haven't already been on it. I know I've been on it, but I haven't really been on there more than once as a host. So I have to get a little bit more well versed on it. Um, are the rest of you familiar with the Zoom as well? I see yes. Tom and Phil. Okay. How about you, yeah. Al? Are you familiar with it? I am not. It's not a whole lot different. It's just it has a few more bells and whistles. Um, some of them we'll utilize, some of them we won't. Um, for example, they have a place where you can raise your hand virtually um, if you want to be recognized to speak. Um, there's other things like breakout rooms that we probably would never use. Um, but those are features that are available on that. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. I think it so takes a little bit more on the uh, organizer in order to remember to look for the raised hands and all those sorts of things. That was the only thing that, that I found a little bit difficult to get used to was looking for that. Sorry about the dog. They're excited again. <laughs> So I guess we'll plan on going forward with that in August unless something significantly changes between now and then. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll send out the notices that we'll have the in-person and the hybrid link in case somebody is in a position where they have to call in or Zoom in. Does that sound good? Yes. Good. Sounds All right. good. good. All right. No objections there. Uh, we're on the future agenda items. Anybody have any future agenda items they would like to speak about? All right, I'm sure we'll come up with some. We're still going to have some more approval processes to go through on some of these, and we're starting to get a few other uh, proposals um, in front of us as staff, but we haven't gone through them yet. Um, but maybe by August, we, we will have reviewed one or two more and we'll just keep bringing things here. It's been a really busy year and I think we've done a lot of good work. So I'm really, I'm really pleased where we're at. Other than that, I guess I would entertain the motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed. We're adjourned at 7.30. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.